Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my friends and fellow elite achievers. Welcome back to Modern Leadership. So let's jump on the Wayback Train and talk about 2005 for a minute. I had just graduated from law school, passed the bar exam, and landed a new gig as in-house counsel for a national nonprofit. And one of my brand new responsibilities, delivering presentations. I was asked to present in workshops, small groups, and even some really big gatherings. Over the next six years, I presented over 200 times, and guess what? It launched the rest of my career. People throughout the company knew my name, potential clients, new clients, long-term clients all recognized who I was. I built friendships, found mentors, and had a lot of fun. I am convinced that speaking played one of the most impactful roles in getting me to where I am today, and I still seek every opportunity to speak publicly. I feel so strongly about the role of speaking in accelerating a career that I invited one of the great public speakers and speaking promoters, Pete Vargas, to join us today. Pete is founder and CEO of Advance Your Reach. Since 2003, get this, Pete and his team have booked over 20,000 events that have generated over 40 million in revenue and reached tens of millions of people. The reason why people flock to learn from Pete is not just his intensity and passion for the stage, which you're going to see is evident, but his ability to find the right stage book that stage, and scale any speaker, author, or entrepreneur's entrepreneur's enterprise far beyond the stage. He has booked legendary speakers, including Ryan Dice and Shark Tank's Damon John, and shared the stage with titans such as Michael Phelps, Robert Cialdini, Howie Mandel, Brendan Bouchard. Pete, it is so great to have someone with your expertise and background on the show. How are you doing today? I'm great, man. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited about, about our time today. Well, we spent just a couple of minutes where I shared, you know, my speaking background and the impact that it's had on me. You do a ton of this. So give us a little bit of background of who you are, how you got into public speaking and the impact that it's had in your life. Yeah. So I actually had the opportunity out of high school to, I mean, out of college to be able to go and take over and be, go into a corporate entrepreneurial job, like an entrepreneurial job out of college or go back to my hometown and be the youth pastor. And uh, my pastor called me and just said, hey, I would love for you to come back and, and consider this. And and I was thinking, oh, cool, I got two job opportunities. Well, let's see how they compete against compensation. And one of them was really good. And the youth pastor job was $18,000 a year. And I, for some crazy reason, chose that because um, not because of background or Bible training or theology training. It was because he felt like I could come in there and impact the kids' lives in this community. And so I was like, yeah, I can do that, I think. Um, and I had this strategy in my mind on how I was going to do it. And so I went back into the town first Wednesday night thinking there was going to be dozens of speakers there or dozens of kids there, excuse, excuse me. And I thought, man, I can't wait. This is my first night. I'm going to motivate them, inspire them, tell them how we're going to change this community. And there were three kids there. And I was I was over. I was like, wow, I thought there was going to be more. And I got a lot of work ahead of me. And so Jory, McKenzie, and Stacy showed up that night, and I told them, I said, we're going to change this community, and we're going to do it by bringing powerful speakers in. Because I had had speakers that impacted my life, my mindset, my finances, my health, my wealth, like all of it growing up. And coming from like a broken relationship, I had heard a lot of people on stages that really had made an influence on my life. So I thought if I could bring those types of people to my kids, it could be transformational. And that's exactly what I did. I brought in I mean, if you if people Google these people, they'll see that they're, you know, got powerful messages just like your audience does. I brought in people like Rick Rigsby and Chad Hennings and um, it was Melvin Adams and uh, Harlem Globetrotter, Larry Brown, Super Bowl MVP of the Dallas Cowboys. I brought in stay at home moms, stay at home dads. I brought in financial advisors. I brought in CEOs. I brought in health and wellness experts. I brought in all these different people because one by one, I would see that in one hour on a stage, the influence that they would have on my kids to actually take action and want to change. And so our youth group was just growing. Things were amazing. Um, when it was time to go to the church board to ask for a million dollar youth facility, Facility because our it was growing so much. It was a unanimous yes because our kids had raised tens of thousands of dollars out of their own money because of a speaker that talked about being a giver and not a taker, and it really stuck with them. And so we were growing. My first Wednesday night, there three kids. 
my last Wednesday night, 750 kids there my last Wednesday night. And it was all because of these speakers I brought in. And, and actually, I officiated two out of those three girls' weddings. Um, the, uh, the third one hasn't gotten married yet, but I have gotten the opportunity. You know, They were very pivotal in like really helping me grow that. Well, one of the speakers I brought in, his name was Daryl Scott. And his daughter was the first girl killed at Columbine back in 1999. And I, and, and I had a mentor that told me I needed to bring him in. And so I brought him in. And he was in the, they were in the schools that day. And I remember his final challenge that day in, I don't know, January of 2003. Um, he said, there's five people in your life that you love, that you need to let them know how much you love them. And, you, and, and some of them you're not in good standings with today. And I couldn't help but think about my dad because I hated my dad. I hated my dad because of what he did to me as a little kid. I hated my dad because of the father, the absent father that he was. And I and I especially hated him because he hadn't made things right with me. And I had tried so many things in my teenage years to try to get that relationship restored and nothing worked. And so I'm 23 years old. I bring my dad back that night. And I, th- I think to myself, this is, this is going to be the night. And that night uh, at the parent event, there were a thousand parents in the auditorium and um, at the end of the presentation, Daryl challenged the parents to to love their kids, to be present for their kids, to to for, ask their kids for forgiveness where it was needed. And and that night, I didn't. It didn't happen that night like I wanted to. But a couple of weeks later, I got a letter in the mail, and it's um, the letter said it was from my dad. It said, "I'm sorry for the father I've been. Here, my son is having an impact on hundreds of kids' lives, and I can't have an impact on my only son's life. I'm asking for a second chance to do things right." And he told me he loved me for the first time in over a decade. And I thought to myself, my wife and I were just sitting there and we were crying. And I thought to myself, what just happened? Like I had tried church. I tried counseling. His seven siblings told him he needed to make things right with me growing up. And finally, I realized the power of one hour on a stage. And that was the day that I really saw the power personally. I'd already seen it a lot because of the way my kids were responding. But that day it became real to me. And that was the day subconsciously, I don't want to say like consciously I dedicated my life to stages that day, but subconsciously that was the day I dedicated my life to stages. And and literally over the course of the last 15 years, as you said, we booked directly, we booked over 25,000 stages across the world. And you know that and we've seen those stages have great influence on the world. And so, yeah, I called that man. I called Daryl Scott and I said, why aren't you getting your message out there in front of more people? And why aren't you influencing more people? And he's like, Pete, I want to change the school system in America. And I really want to make an impact to create cultures of kindness and compassion on schools all across the country. And I said, he, I go, what are you doing to make that happen? And he was doing this and that and this and that and all of these bright, shiny object things. He was trying a lot of different things and they weren't working. And I said, why aren't you using stages in speaking? Like if you got in front of building principals and superintendents and they heard what I just heard, all of them would want to bring your school program. At that time, it wasn't really created, but all of them would want to bring your programs back into their schools. And that's exactly the path we started down is that we would get him in front of people. He would influence them and be very powerful on a stage, some small, some medium, some large stages. And we would see that a significant amount of them would then bring his programs back into their schools. And that's where their schools would be changed. And so I'm a big believer. That's where my whole kind of like history of speaking got started. But I'm a big believer that stages are one of the fastest ways to not just make a deep impact and influence, but ultimately to see people go deeper with you, whether it's a donor, whether it's a customer, whether it's a voter, it doesn't matter. Like when you get on a stage, the way that you can influence people in 60 minutes and really the power that you have, it's so powerful. So that's my background, Jake, on on stages. Yeah, and it's an incredible story. And I really appreciate you taking the time to dive into it because it really sets the, you know, the groundwork for where we're going to go in this, you know, podcast episode. And really, I think we could go in two directions. Direction number one is just how you built up this youth pastorship that you were working on, how you got speakers to come in. And while I think that's fascinating, it would be worthy of spending our time. 
What I'm more interested in today is, you know, I'm a business leader and the listeners of this podcast are business leaders. And maybe we're like this uh, parent in, at Columbine that we have a message, but we're doing this and we're doing that and we're squirreling here and squirreling there and we're just not getting any traction. And so we bring you on this show because you're an expert about getting people on the stage. So talk to us about where we start. How do we get ourselves up on the stage and why is it important that we do so? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I'm glad we're going that route. I was going to choose option two after I heard option one, but option one would be fun. And you and I can do that offline sometime, but real, yeah, really, you know, why is it important? It's important because stages have been around for 2000 years and stages aren't going anywhere. Like you think back to the Coliseum, I mean, and you think back to people like raising money, you talked about being with a nonprofit, like thousands of years ago, people were using stages and they're not going anywhere. And what I see in, in, as business leaders, I see us trying all of these different marketing things and these marketing tactics and they're, they work well, but they're here today. And sometimes they're gone tomorrow, like yellow pages. Like I'm having, I would never invest in yellow pages anymore. You know, you think about radio and TV, it's never been harder. You think about mediums, like even like Facebook that's changed so much, but stages aren't going anywhere. And they, when you have the undivided attention of an audience for 15, 30, 45, 60 minutes, and you're on a physical or a digital stage, it's powerful what begins to happen and how people engage with you. But can't you spin your wheels a little bit? I mean, I agree 100% with what you're talking about. And, and all these other platforms that we're, that we're seeing, you know, are kind of second, you know, we don't talk about them quite as much. And I want to focus on these stages, but can't we spin our wheels a little bit? I mean, if I'm, if I'm a business leader, I'm sure that there's 4,000 rotaries that would love to have me come out and speak to 10 or 15 people or Kiwanis clubs. Uh, How do we identify what's going to be the biggest impact for our message? And then not just what's going to be the biggest impact, but how do I get on that stage? Yeah. So the first place, how are you going to make the biggest impact is all determined by what type of business leader you on. You have I've obviously, you know, very familiar with the show and know that you have business leaders that are doing all types of things. You have, you probably have nonprofit business leaders. You probably have corporate business leaders. You probably have, you know, folks in the service-based business. And we have aspiring business leaders. Yeah. You have aspiring business leaders. And so the first key to making sure that you're not spinning your wheels on the wrong stages is getting really, really clear with who you serve. Who is it that you make an impact on? Who are your customers? For Rachel's challenge, when they started understanding that the building principals, the superintendents, the assistant superintendents, the assistant principals, the school boards were their customers, we stopped going to the Rotary Clubs. And no knock on the Rotary Clubs, but you might have one building principal in the Rotary Club. That means that it's significantly the minority of who you serve that's in that audience. We define a dream stage, not by the number of people in the audience, although we'd love to have you in front of five, 10,000 people when the time is right. We define a dream stage where the majority of people sitting in the audience are your ideal buyers. They're your ideal customers. They're the ideal people that you want to serve. So in Rachel's Challenges case, we weren't going to parents or rotary clubs per se. We were going to places where the majority of people were that demographic. And that's the first mistake that people make as they're trying to go and pursue stages and get on stages is they'll just go to any stage and it's like, oh, three out of the hundred people or one out of the 15 people were actually your ideal client. It's no wonder that, you know, that kind of feels like a rat race. And so we call that a dream stage, Jake. And it's really the majority of people in the audience being that ideal customer for you. Yeah. And this is so important because it really is easy to get on stages when you identify where you're going. And I, I'll tell you, when I worked for the nonprofit, I spoke at a lot of rotaries because who was my target audience? Business leaders within the community. Where did they gather? They gathered at rotary. But now that I've shifted my personal business and a lot of listeners here have have, have personal businesses that are differently, we need to start looking at where does our audience hang out? And that really starts with clarity on your message and understanding what it is that you want to speak to. Now, one of the things that you had talked about earlier is you had listened to a speaker who was very inspirational, very moving for you, but he didn't really have a product to sell at the time. Now that's come later. This is what he's doing now. But at the time, he just wanted to share his message. What do you say to people who just have a message they want to share and you know they're kind of just bouncing around going anywhere that their message will be heard? 
Yeah, I would say two things. I would say make sure you're getting paid for it, which is called keynote speaking. And that's one way that you can scale past the stage. Scale past the stage means attract new customers. So you need you want to either be getting paid to be a speaker um, and there's people who want to do that. And we've done that for hundreds, if not thousands of people over the last 15 years. But but here's the thing. You either want to get paid or you're just in a season of life where you feel like that's what you want to do and you don't care if you get paid or not. But like if you want to share a message, make sure that you're actually getting paid to share that message. And so that's what we call a, you know, a keynote fee. And so that's what I'd encourage people to do. However, I believe I'm a big advocate of this. I believe what the great Zig Ziglar said, Jake. I believe that um, Zig said, I've never changed someone's life with a speaking gig, but sometimes they buy my tapes and cassettes and I've got a shot at changing their lives. I want to break that down to your audience. Yeah, please do, because we are huge Zig Ziglar fans. From eight years old, we've been listening, you know, me personally. So break that down for us. Help us understand what Zig was talking about. Yeah, so Zig said, I'm not going to change someone's life on a stage in 60 minutes, but if they buy my programs, if they buy my tapes, if they buy my cassettes, I'm in their ears every single day. And that's when I change their lives. And so I quote that all the time. Like, I want the stage to be the starting point, not the ending point. I want you to provide incredible value on the stage. And when you provide incredible value on the stage and lay out the roadmap of how somebody can get success in their business, in their relationships, in their mindset, in their finances, in their life, in their school, in their church, in their corporations, in their business, when you lay out the roadmap and the success path of how they can do that, they're going to have two options, either try to go do it on their own or do it with you and it is important just like the great zig had programs that it went past the stage it's very important for your listeners to be able to say if you're not going to get paid to speak there is some way past the stage that i want people to go deeper with you if it's not speaking maybe i'm going to i'm going to tell you how you go past the stage and we know this cuz we've created all 8 of these and and help our clients sell all 8 of these okay before you do that i got to interrupt I got to tell you that this great Zig Ziglar experience that I had. So exactly what you're talking about. I saw Zig live for the first time when I was 12 years old. I bought my own ticket. It was $175. My dad bought his ticket, $175. We sat on the third row. While we were there, I heard Zig say, to get the most out of my cassettes, this was back in the cassette days, Pete, to get the most out of my cassettes, you have to listen to them 16 times. Now, I heard him say 16 times in a row. My dad and I still differ on this. He didn't think he said it 16 times in a row, but I said 16 times in a row. I had at the time nine cassette tapes of Zig Ziglar, and I went through them 16 times each in a row, listening to every word of them because I believed what he was saying. And what you're telling me really resonates because I saw him on stage and I could have had that emotion and that good experience and walked out the door and never changed my life. But by taking his tapes and listening to him 16 times in a row, I tell you, he's my most quoted author, my most quoted keynote speaker, and probably one of my most influential mentors throughout my entire life. And I never met him other than that one time on the on the stage when he signed my book. You know, that just gives me goosebumps actually hearing that story. And I want to like actually piggyback off of that really quickly, even before I get into the eight. So I quote that's I quote that quote all the time. I've never changed someone's life with the speaking gig, but sometimes they buy my tapes and cassettes. I got a shot at changing their lives. And last week, I had a call scheduled. Somebody said, you need to speak with Tom Ziegler, Zig's son, who's the CEO of the Ziegler organization. And I told Tom that quote. And Tom goes, Pete, I want to give you some data to back up that quote. I'm like, yeah, please. That's awesome. And he said, Pete, my dad would get all of it. He would get this lady. He told me about this lady who still works there today. And his dad would get, him, get her to get all of the testimonials out, that, like every testimonial that Zig got. And for every 100 testimonials that they would get out, 99 of them, 99 of them would say, Zig, your programs, your tapes, your cassettes, your seminar, are you like seminars, not your speaking, like those things made an impact on my life. And one of them would say, you speaking on a stage made an impact on my life. And so it was, it was verified, you know, it just verified. I thought it was beautiful that it verified the quote that he said. And so, yeah, I believe that. I believe, Jake, that we want people to go deeper with you because when you go when they go deeper with you they listen to your tape 16 times in a row over nine nine different times and that's where you are influenced as a 12 year old and still 
it's still, you know, impacting you today. Like who you are today is, is it, you know, is a huge result of because of those times back when you were 12. So that's why we want people to scale past the stage. And that's just another way of saying being able to attract customers that you get to work with even after the stage. And it's a great leadership principle that Tom Ziegler taught you too. And that is you got to measure everything. I mean, they were measuring the amount of referrals, the amount of, you know, not hat tips, any, any referral not referrals, but uh, what did you call it? Testimonials that came in through the business. They measured it. And because they measured it, it told a story. So wonderful. Now, Pete, we got to get into these eight principles that we were talking about here, these eight stages that you were mentioning. So let's jump into that. Yeah, they're not eight stages, but they're eight ways that you can scale past the stage. So there, you can speak and go do more speaking. One of the things I'd really encourage you to look at is if you have a process or a, con- a piece of content that's not about a personality, a lot of people think I have to be the one to go speak, but we've helped multiple organizations generate a lot of speakers within their one organization. So you can, you can be on a stage and the way that people can scale past the stage with you is either speaking, it's training and consulting, it's um, sponsorship where they actually sponsor things. It's fundraising, and I'm not just talking about nonprofit. We have a lot of success with speaking, leading to donations for a nonprofit, but even for profit in, 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 you know, in funding and real estate investing or whatever it is. So fundraising is a fourth area. Um, a digital and physical products is a sixth area, a fifth area, excuse me. Service-based companies. That's the sixth, like to be able to speak and allow people to go deeper with your marketing agency or your tech company or your financial services. Like there are thousands, millions of stages at the local level, millions of stages at the local level. And speaking is one of the most powerful ways for service-based companies to do that. We just had a student of ours say he booked a, you know, he's about to, or he might have already booked, I think he did book a dental, a local dental association. He's going to be in front of 50 dentists and he's a financial advisor. That's a prime stage for him. So service-based business is the sixth area. And I do a lot of consulting with lawyers. I mean, a lot of the people that I work with on a daily basis are lawyers. And this is a tremendous way for them to grow their local reach is by getting on some stages locally. It's a, And it's another way to build reputation and credit ability within the community. So I couldn't agree with this one more, Pete. Yeah. And then, so the seventh is your own events. Like speaking can help you fill your own events, like speaking on other people's stages. And then, and then the last and final area is coaching and masterminds. That's like, if you have coaching programs or you have masterminds, speaking is a powerful way to grow it. And so those eight areas are the eight areas that you can scale past the stage, which was pretty much anything that you can possibly think about falls within those eight buckets. And so that's what we mean by when we say scaling past the stage, we want people to go deeper with you. It's about really like we go back to how we started this conversation. It's knowing what your end goal is, what you're trying to build, what you're trying to create. The audience you're trying to speak to will tell you which one of these eight beyond the stage growth strategies that you can take and employ. And I want to dive into just one of them while we've got the time here, Pete. And I want to talk, because I mentioned I talk so much to lawyers and service-based businesses that I wanted to dive into this one a little bit more and get your take on on you know how we do this within our local community. Let's say, for example, I am a lawyer, and and by the way, I am a lawyer, but I don't practice locally. But uh, you know, what do we what do we tell our service based companies? How do we get started on this, and what's the impact? Yeah, so people want to understand like these stages, like how why would a financial advice why would a local dental association open up their stage for a financial advisor? Like that's prime candidates for the financial advisor. Well, they would open it up because we're not positioning them as a financial advisor, we're positioning them as a content provider. Big difference. One you're a vendor, one you're like looked at as like heroic, like wow, you're gonna come in here and show our people how to stop leaking money in their practices. That's solving a problem for the meeting planner. My definition of a meeting planner is the person who controls the stage. In this case, Jake controls this podcast. So it doesn't matter if it's a podcast or a local stage. The meeting planner is the one that controls it, and they don't want you to be a vendor going in there. They want you to be a content provider. They want you to solve a problem for their audience, and when that light bulb goes off, 
When, when you can really articulate a problem you can solve for an audience, all of a sudden they want to bring you in and allow you to be able to speak to their community. And so that's whether it's a lawyer, a financial advisor, a marketing agency, a tech agency, whatever it is, you all have solutions. Like the first time I heard a lawyer talk about a trust, my financial advisor said, hey, I would love for this uh, my friend to come talk about the blah, blah, blahs of trust. I don't even remember what he said. But he didn't say, I want my lawyer to you know, come sell all your people trust. No, he wanted, he wanted him to be able to talk about the importance of revocable or irrevocable. I can't even remember it. But I remember listening to it. It's a small group setting, not a lot of people. And I looked at my wife. I'm like, we well, got to get one of these. And that's the power, whether it's one-on-one or one-to-many. We just so happen to love one-to-many is that if you can begin to position yourself as a content provider, a, a, a problem solver, um, and people can begin to see that, the light bulb goes off for a meeting planner, that's when they hire you. And when they hire you, you go in there and you do exactly that. You actually provide content and watch what will begin to happen. The power, I call it the one hour launch. Like we do a lot of sales and marketing things that take us eight, 12 months of a sales cycle, but it gets expedited when you get 60 minutes in front of people. It's amazing how the sales cycle is completely exp- you know, expedited from the power of one hour. So that's what I would encourage them to do. Now we're talking to people who are very busy in their careers and they're working in careers that uh, you know, focus their mind and their attention in different areas. You know, the stage isn't primary at the top of their mind, like a, like it would be for a full time professional public speaker. And so, you know, I hear what you're saying, and you know, let's say I'm a local attorney here or a local electrician, and I want to get on a stage. Where do I start? You talk about these meeting planners. Do I Google them? Where do I start to get going? Yeah, so I'm actually I'm gonna play around with this, but like if you're trying to like I'm just gonna take continue to take the dentists. And so you would just look like you would just look for like associations for dentists or conferences for dentists or whatever for dentists in Colorado Springs or in Denver or in this is where I'm at. And as I pull up a search, it's like, oh, I've got the ADA, the American Dental Association. And as I'm going there, I'm like, oh wow, front page, they have like 500 different chapters across the country. That's pretty cool. Then I click on the 500 chapters and it literally shows me not only every state chapter, but every individual chapter. And so as you begin to, you got to remember, this is about finding your target market. You don't want to necessarily, I, rotaries are perfect in the scenario that you talked about earlier. Like it was perfect for you in your former career, but now it's not. And so that's why just doing a few searches and finding five to 10 stages, either in your local backyard or if you're somebody that wants to be on national stages, on national stages, but you begin to just search the actual demographic industry niche that you are wanting to attract, couple it with some keywords like geography words, like if you want to stay local or if you want to go national, and you will begin to find more stages than you can ever be on. Now, I think it's important to state, like state, like I've seen this with people who've never used speaking as like a primary thing, like you're saying, they're like, Oh, like that's for professional speakers who get paid. Now, what I want to what I want to say to that is, yes, it is a new form of marketing for them. And so there is resistance to it. But I want you to know that the people who who break through that resistance, they become the known authority in their backyards. They become the one, the only one or one of the few that are doing that. And now it begins to ripple around a community or a state or even nationally. And now all of a sudden they're getting invited to multiple places. So it's just breaking through the fact that, yeah, this is a new marketing channel for us. It's a new customer acquisition channel and, and it can become a powerful channel. And this one quick story that I want to share around that is we had a guy that was like told like, don't use stages, don't use speaking for multiple years. They were like, it's a rat race. It's, you know, you got to be a road warrior. And then all of a sudden he was introduced to a similar teaching that we're doing today. And he's like, Pete, I'm going to give this a shot. And he gave it a shot starting in 2018. And now as we're coming upon the end of 2018, it's going to be the number two customer acquisition channel for him rivaling what is his top way of attracting customers. And so like it's, I know there will be resistance for people who've never done it, but, but if you choose to do it, you know, it, you will stick out and you will become like a, uh, it's going to position you in a place that maybe you haven't been positioned before. Now, how much competition is there? You know, we've been using this dentist example and using, you know, the ADA, uh, how many financial planners are reaching out and trying to get on, on the calendar? I mean, how much competition is there for these stages? 
I can't tell you really with a whole lot of data, but whether it's an advisor or a lawyer or whatever it is, there's not a lot. I will tell you that it is not a lot because of what you said. It's like new. It's different. It's but we've we've literally booked thousands of local stages, not necessarily for advisors, but for all different niches and industries. And local stages are just powerful. They're just it's so powerful because they're the easiest stages, as you know. They're really not difficult to book. Yeah, and how about my fear of not being a good public speaker? And I say my fear. I know there's lots of listeners. I personally love the stage. I mean, I eat it up. I, I, I can hardly sleep the night before I'm so excited. But a lot of our listeners are afraid to get up on stage. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people would rather die than go public speak. And so what I would tell you is, yeah, I don't want to – we've talked about the stage. We've talked about scaling the stage. Really, the third part of our equation, which is actually should have – is is the first part in the equation. Like we actually have a methodology, and the methodology says in order to use stages to grow your reach and your business, you want to be great on stage. You want to get on the stage, and you want to scale past the stage. And so we've talked a lot about two and three, but the first one about being great on stage is – yeah, people, I mean, it's important to really establish um, a, a good presence on stage. And we have a framework that ha- that teaches people how to do that, to make them feel comfortable, allows them to be themselves. But our belief is like really establish one incredible talk, like establish one really, really good talk. And as you establish one really, really good talk and you begin to use the framework that we talk about, which says start with the heart. What people want to be able to do right off the bat is connect with you, like period. They want to be able to connect with you. And not only do they want to connect with you out of the gates, they also want to see that you're ordinary, meaning you've walked in their shoes, and that you're extraordinary. You know something that they don't know. Because as you present that gap in the opening heart, their hearts are open and now their minds are ready to be taught. So the first piece of this is the heart. Um, connecting ordinary, extraordinary, when you can kind of map that out on a piece of paper, like, okay, here it is, got it. Then there's the head. You then have their minds open to say, teach me how to move from an ordinary to extraordinary. And that's the teaching part. Like the majority of the time, 60 to 70% is taught around the head, like three to five steps on how to move from the ordinary to the extraordinary. This works in any industry, any any industry. We've done it in every industry. And so that's the middle part of the section, and you wanna teach, and then with each critical step, either reinforce it with something that moves the left brain or the right brain. The right brain obviously is the creative, so like sometimes we will tell a story to reinforce that point. We'll tell a Zig Ziglar quote to reinforce that point. Other times we'll give data, case studies or stats that way you're mixing it up that you're driving home every point that's with either a right brain example or a left brain example that way by the time you're done with your three four or five points you've really hit both the right brain and the left brain learners in the audience yeah you're speaking to everybody that's there and you're speaking in the language that they understand resonate with and will take home with them that's exactly right and then the third piece of the framework the third uh, out of four is then there's the hands You've now given them, you've opened up their hearts, you've showed them that you're ordinary, you've shown them that you've done something extraordinary, you've taught them. Now it's time to get them to take some type of action. And what we really encourage is giving away a free gift, a free report, a free PDF, something free that literally moves them from A to B. It could be one little thing that helps them with their taxes. It could be one little thing that helps them with their trusts. It could be one little thing that really helps move them from A to B. The problem and the mistake people make is they try to give a gift that's A to Z, if they give a gift at all, a book, a whole PowerPoint slide, a 48 page like PDF file. No, give them something simple. And if they can get a quick win, when I heard a financial person on a stage that showed me how I could rent my house back to my company and save some money on my taxes ethically and legally, I went and tested it, saw that it worked. And as soon as I had a conversation with him, I literally invested in his programs and his services. And so like, what's your quick win that you can get them in their life from going from A to B? Give them a free gift. And by giving them a free gift, that also allows you to capture their names and information. Yeah, I was going to ask if this is a list building opportunity. 
For sure. Absolutely. And when you do it well and your gift is valuable, we have data, 15 years of data that says you'll collect 60, 70, 80. Just this last weekend, we collected over 90 to 95 percent of the actual room by giving away a free gift. And so that's the third piece. It's the hands. It starts with the heart, about 10 to 15 percent, moves to the head, about 70 percent moves to the hands, another five to 10%, and then it closes with the heart. Close out a story with a story that reinforces everything you taught. Like everything you taught, some type of story that will reinforce everything you taught. When you can use that framework and you can actually outline a talk and create one amazing talk and do some repetition of that talk, um, you will begin to overcome that fear of speaking by using that framework. And we've seen it time in and time out. And when you're talking to someone like me, Pete, I'm a very analytical person and I love to see this in a framework. See, I can envision what this heart, head, hands, heart rotation through my speeches. And when you start putting percentages on there, I can really see what I need to do. And I can see how that can take my nerves down and really give me the confidence to get up and deliver a powerful speech, one that will change my business and my life. Now I'm looking at our time and we're running a little bit short. And while there's plenty more that you and I can talk about and probably should talk about, we'll save that for your last bit of advice and we'll let people connect with you. But before we go there, the last section are learning from leaders where we ask a few personal questions to go with this business conversation. Does that sound okay? I love it, man. Great. All right. What book is currently on your Kindle or bedside table? What are you reading these days? Yeah, I'm actually, I mean, I'm like a lot of entrepreneurs where I'm reading a lot of books. Um, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a lot going on right now. And so I'm actually, I'm looking on my Kindle because I have, um, I'm reading um, I've been recommended this, the, the uh, Mark Manson book. I won't say the words, but the, so, the subtle art of not giving a flip. So I, I'll use the flip. I am just have been encouraged by several friends to read that. I'm in the last chapter of it. And how, what do you think so far? I thought it was pretty good, man. I, I enjoyed I think he. I think he's got some amazing nuggets that I hadn't thought about, and I've, I've enjoyed the book. You know, I'm kind of in this period of my life. I've read so many books. In fact, I average a book a week that I'm to the point now where I'm just looking for nuggets. I don't expect any book to blow me away and be like, this is information I've never heard before. It's going to change my life. But I do expect to be motivated to take small actions or small bites at the elephant to move myself forward. I completely agree with that. So I've gotten some amazing nuggets from the book. Very nice. All right. Our next question is the leadership superpower. What is your leadership superpower? Um, I think my leadership superpower is two things come to mind. It's woo, like in the strength finders, like winning others over. That's a, that's a leadership superpower for me. And I think just like from a tactical standpoint, it's really stages. I don't feel like anybody, uh, very few people in the world really understand stages like me. So tactically speaking, I would say stages is, is a leadership superpower for me. And I would absolutely agree with you, Pete, which is the reason I've been so interested in getting you on the show, because when it comes to stages and the power and your ability to speak passionately about it, I mean, it's a game changer. So I would agree your leadership superpower is really the ability to use stages to really connect with others. Uh, how about your leadership philosophy, motivation, or quote that you live by? Um, you know, I, I love my Angelou. People forget what you said. People forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And it's something that I live by. Like, I feel like that's definitely a, a quote that I love. And I love a lot of her stuff. She has so much amazing stuff. I also love Prince EA. And I would say this, but I, he, he quoted something like of the sort, like a lot of the most powerful messages that live on this earth are actually in the graveyard. And he has got a beautiful video around that. So those are two things that stick out to me a lot that I use a lot. Well, it's a wonderful quote. Both of them are wonderful thoughts. And I want to take our listeners back to how we started out this podcast, your story about your father and connecting with your father and the emotions. And I got to tell you, you know, I had the hairs on the back of my neck standing up through that story. You, you made me not just learn and hear the story, but also feel it. So great quote there. A final question for you is the book that you most often gift to friends, family, or colleagues. Yeah, I, I gift The Miracle Morning a lot. Oh, oh yeah, Hal Elrod. He's been a guest on this show. He's a wonderful speaker and uh, a great book. Yeah, we get the opportunity to work with Hal, and I just love who he is. 
but I love, I mean, my kids do the miracle morning. They have their own miracle morning. So I'm, I, that's the, probably the book I've gifted the most. Oh, wonderful. All right, Pete, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Your expertise is so valuable to the listeners. Before we let you go, how can we learn more? How can we continue this conversation with you? Yeah, no, I, and, and, you know, just like one final quick thought, you know, I, I think it's important for people to understand this, no matter what you're doing in your business. I just, my wife and I actually just found out that we were pregnant for the first time in 16 years of marriage. Congratulations. Yeah. We were told we would never have kiddos and on our 40th, around on our 40th birthday, we've adopted all three of our kids and we just found out on our 40th, we're having kids, but it made me think about something. It made me think about the call I got 12 years ago from my dad. My dad was 49. My stepmom was 48. And he called us and he told us he's pregnant. And I was a little upset because I didn't have a kid yet. My oldest is 10. And I went home to meet my my little brother for the first weekend 12 years ago. And I remember seeing something different. And my wife and I were like, something's different here. And as we kind of walked out of the house that day, I remember walking to the car and my dad walking me over there. And and it's amazing what he asked for in the letter that he wrote me, you know, several years previous, he had asked for a second chance to do things right. And it, that day he looked at me in my eyes and he just said, I want you to know you'll always be my little boy, but I feel like JT is my second chance to get to do things right. And I have seen him be that to my little brother JT, but I've also seen him be that to my kids and my sister's kids. And I'm letting you know like that wouldn't have happened without the power of a stage. And for many of you out there, the analytical thinkers, you might be thinking, yeah, but Pete, that guy lost his daughter at Columbine. He was a motivational speaker. What I would have you know is the very first time I heard my financial advisor on a stage, I hired her. Very first time I heard my lawyer, a uh, lawyer with my trust, I hired him. Very first time I heard a man talk about digital marketing, I bought everything that he had to offer. Very first time I heard access.org on a stage, not only did I say, Kim, we need their parenting resources, but we donated to their nonprofit. So all of them aren't motivational speakers. Stages impact people's lives. And the biggest thing that I can encourage your listeners to do is to really think about how they can make some progress on stages. And so, yeah, I I appreciate you having me. Advance, I mean, simple gift that we want to give to everybody is advanceyourreach.com forward slash ML from obviously for modern leadership, advanceyourreach.com forward slash ML. We have a workshop, a virtual workshop, and it really dives into all three areas that we talked about today. And yeah, I would love for the, to be able to give that to your listeners. It's up, I think it's up through November and we'll kind of sub it out once we get past that, but it's a powerful workshop. We got a few gifts, a few resources there, and it will really help you understand how to use stages and speaking to really grow your business or whatever it is that you're doing. And we're going to link all of that up on the show notes for this page so the listeners can go right there. One of the advantages I get for being the the host is I can go on this today and I can check this out today. So I'm very excited about that. Pete, you have come, you've brought value, you've inspired us, you started with the heart, you ended with the heart, and we sure appreciate you being this week's Modern Leader. Thank you. Thank you for having me. A huge thank you to Pete for coming on the show and really talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. You know, I told you in the intro, I love to publicly speak. I mean, it's being on the stage is one of my most favorite things to do. And so when I had this opportunity to talk with a real expert about how to develop a stage presence, how to develop, you know, beyond the stage, how to go from the stage to more in your life, I jumped at the opportunity and I really appreciate Pete and all his message, you know, walking through the eight opportunities that you have once you're on the stage to take it to the next level. But what I found really impactful is how to create a speech that starts with heart, ends with heart, And in the middle, you address the head and the hands. You get people to act. I really love that conversation. Thank you, Pete, again, for coming on the show, delivering value. Of course, everything that we talked about on this episode can be found at jakeacarlson.com slash ml99, episode 99. We are one away from 100. Can you believe it? We're going to have a lot of fun next week on the podcast. But until then, I want to wish you the very best of days and even better life. Of course, use the stage, promote, have opportunity, really enjoy this experience and stay awesome. (laughs) 
Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Oh,